Hello, this is Forrie Ackerman, editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland and Spacemen. I've heard from thousands and thousands of you fans since the world's original film monster magazine began in 1958. And many's the time I've wished I was the beast with a million eyes in order to read all your letters quicker. Well, having heard from all of you, it seems only fair, doesn't it, that you should now hear from all of me. As you probably guessed, I'm Dr. Acula and Carlon Torgosi and his sister Vespertina. Vespertina is the Transylvanian word for bat. I'm also Weaver Wright and Spencer Strong and a long list of other names, including Mechanical Man and Robot Mitchum. I've been interested in robots for about 35 years. And as a boy of 10, I had the thrilling experience of seeing the great film masterpiece, Metropolis, when it was brand new. It was a silent picture produced in the mid-twenties, and the most unforgettable scene was when the robot was animated. When that smooth, streamlined, mechanical, humanoid figure was commanded to rise by Rotwang, its creator, and slowly, ever so slowly, an inch at a time, almost like Imhotep, the Egyptian mummy, dead 3,700 years, the robot moved and came to life. You could almost hear the whirring as Rotvang, his artificial hand covered with a black leather glove, ordered his robot tricks, was in female form, you see, to rise from her chair and present her cold, steeled hand to John Masterman, the master of Metropolis, greatest city on earth in the year 2026. 2026, hmm. Come to think of it, that's quite a few years yet. You suppose we'll have to wait that long to see real robots? I doubt it. Actually, already, the robots are among us. And that's the title of a fascinating book by Rolf Strail, who says that, fantastic as it may seem, the time may one day come when a man in the streets may be as rare a sight as a horse is today. Robot chess players may not seem very alarming, Mr. Strail says, and electronic calculators that can perform in a minute the work of ten men laboring ceaselessly for a hundred years are an obvious advantage. But what of the robot spy? The guided missile with its atomic warhead. Satellitic eyes in the skies. disturbing incident of the robot that ran amok and Frankenstein-like murdered its creator. Of legendary origin is our first information about the artificial beings known as androids. Aristotle described a wooden Venus capable of movement, whose limbs were filled with mercury instead of blood. During the third century BC, a flying wooden pigeon was reported. In the 10th century AD, we hear of the creation of an automatic talking head. The great genius Leonardo da Vinci built a moving metal lion for King Louis XII and also created a metal dragon. Leonard Maelzel, the man who invented the metronome, created a sensation during his lifetime with a musical android completed in 1807. He also demonstrated a chess machine which inspired Edgar Allan Poe to write Maelzel's Chessman. In 1778, Baron Kempelen of Bohemia publicly demonstrated the first talking robot the first machine to speak text through artificial means. A publication of the day reported that, quote, the monstrous things spoke with the voice of a three to four-year-old child 
in a distinct, clear, and slow voice, all syllables very audibly. It may be that Campbell and Stalking Robot sounded something like this. In the French play, The Revolt of the Machines, huge engines, super tractors, gigantic cranes, mechanical saws, dynamic dredgers, even psychological thought reading devices clash with one another in the hall of a great exhibition. During the night, the machines break through the walls of the auditorium and run wild in the streets, destroying homes, knocking over towers, devastating fields. The military might is mobilized and army artillery is dispatched to destroy the machine monsters. But the guns and tanks and cannons refuse to fire on their fellow machines and instead join the rebels. A few human beings escape, and from a mountainside, watch the destruction of their man-made world. Finally, the foreman of the machine succeeds in turning them against one another. And in the ensuing civil war, they completely destroy each other. But the foreman is already at work on newer, even more monstrous machines. And the likelihood is that it will happen all over again. In his play, Millennium One, W.A. Dwiggins pictured another possible revolt of the robots. Millennium One is a frightening play about Homo Grubb, subterranean man, hiding from murderous machines which possess incredibly powerful means of destruction. At one point in the play, a human being named Blackmaster encounters point thirty-three plus, a robot. And the robot says, In the beginning was man. Man created all things. Man, with his infinite skill, created machines in his own image. Blackmaster interrupts, no, no, not like himself. That was not the idea. Much better than himself. Finer, stronger. Man made you and we were proud of you. But we made you too strong. You broke away from us. We lost control of you. You trampled us into the dust. So now we come to turn you back into earth again, into the salts of metals, back into the earth out of which we made you. And now, inevitably, we come to R.U.R., Rossum's Universal Robots, the famous play that introduced the word robot into the English language. The story, as summarized by Sam Moskowitz, is a tale laid in the near future on an island whose exact location is not specified. Here, a formula to chemically produce artificial humans for use as workers and servants had been adapted to mass production. The manufacturers justify their position on the grounds that eventually robots will free men from all toil and a utopia will emerge. Unfortunately, one of the chemists alters the formula and the robots who have hitherto been without emotions assume the desires for freedom and domination that previously has been characteristic only of the human race. The emotionally advanced leaders among the robots organize a revolt of their minions, which now number millions in key positions throughout the world. The rule of man is cast off, and the human race is ruthlessly exterminated. At bay on their little island, the robot manufacturers suspensefully stave off robot attack, but are betrayed by the president of the Humanitarian League, who even burns Rossum's original formula for the creation of robots. Remorselessly, the robots destroy all but one man whom they command to rediscover Rossum's formula. They offer him the world if he can help them rediscover the secret of the creation of life. However, he is only a builder, not a scientist, 
and cannot duplicate the method. In the end, mutant robots named Helena and Primus become the Adam and Eve of the new android world. In the films, robots, androids, and humanoids came to the screen in Elita, an early Russian space film of a trip to Mars and the finding there of a robot civilization. In Captain Video, The Colossus of New York, The Day the Earth Stood Still with the Great Gort, the heroic robot from space, Devil Girl from Mars, Forbidden Planet, with friendly voice of Marvin Miller as Robbie, Robot Monster, Target Earth, Tobor the Great, the Twonky about a crazy mixed up TV set from the future that could move about, Vampires Over London with Bela Lugosi, and many, many others. Television gave us the notable Alfred Bester play, Murder and the Android. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future and a visit to a robot factory. Mr. Wells has kindly lent me his time machine, and Mr. Pal has graciously taught me how to operate it, so that we'll not only get to the future, but be sure of getting back. There's one thing you must understand, however, before we take off. We can only go as observers and cannot actually intermingle. If we were to get into the future and become involved, there could be some disastrous results. Suppose, for example, a time traveler went back to 1926 and kidnapped me so that I never saw Metropolis. Why, then this record might never have existed. So whatever you do, don't leave the electronic field of our time machine. Okay? Fashion your safety belt. Seventy, eighty, ninety, two thousand. Wow! We traveled so fast that here we are in two thousand and fifty already. Say, isn't that a nifty rocket car that robot is assembling? Doesn't look like it needs any type of tires or wheels. An amazing sight over there, suspended in midair. A great luminescent sign. Must be supported by an anti-gravitic principle. Let's see, it says why... why yes, it's the three laws of robotics propounded by the great Dr. Asimov back in the middle of the 20th century. The red sign reads, A robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. The yellow one says, A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And the white one, A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Very sensible rules. Robots must... Good heavens, a cable snap! It's holding together by a shred of metal, and the, 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 the man there, the foreman, I, right below a car frame dangling over his head. I don't think he sees the danger, but... Well, the, the robot, the robot's super-sensitive photoelectric cells must have detected the danger. Yeah, the robot's now leaping at the startled man who thinks he's gone mad and attacking him. How he looks up and he sees the danger too late. <laughs> last moment, the robot has swept up the foreman in its huge steel arms and tossed him out of the path of the plummeting steel object. The dazed man is being helped to his feet by two other robots. He looks at the mass of twisted wreckage and realizes the robot who saved his life lies smashed underneath, smashed beyond repair. A faithful mechanical servant has saved his life at the sacrifice of its own. Well... That was some experience. 
Now just let me adjust the spatial controls and we'll move to another observation point. There's a sign ahead. 50 miles to Rossum City. Population, 2 million. Robots. Speed limit, 200 miles per hour. Mm, there's a jet car literally flying down the road. Seems to be going faster than that. Uh-oh, a police plane has spotted it. It's zooming down, broadcasting instructions to stop. It's a robot at the controls of the car. And the police are robots, too. I see what's happened. The robot driver is a human passenger who's been hurt, and he's rushing him to a hospital. The robot police are now moving the man to their plane, and there they go. Wow, what a world. Wish I had time to stay here and sightsee all over the planet, but that sound you hear is the warning bell on my time machine letting me know it's time to return to our own world and our own time. Hang on. Wasn't that something, that glimpse at the robotic world of the future? You know, something occurred to me while watching those automatons function. They look a lot like men, do much of man's work. I wonder if... Uh, excuse me a second. Give me Frank Cole in the electronics department, please. Hi, Frank. Forey Ackerman. Hey, Frank, you're a sound effects man, always fooling around with electronic devices. Tell me, uh, do you suppose robots would enjoy listening to music? No, no I'm, not, I'm not joking. You figure that if robots are electronic creations, they'd enjoy listening to electronic music. So by utilizing a variable frequency audio generator, you think you could create a scientific symphony. It would not only send our metal friends, but would also be fascinating to human ears. Would you be willing to work on it? You already have, and it's on the other side of the record. I can't wait to hear it.